folks, welcome back to the 4099 podcast with your hosts, Dima and, and Nick. And uh, first and foremost, we really want to thank everyone, all of our listeners, all of our viewers for coming back, supporting us, uh, really just giving their time to us and giving their ears and listening to all of these podcasts really gives us a good feeling when we see that much outreach and that, that, um, you know, all those numbers going up, that's a good feeling. So we really want to thank you guys. Um, and, uh, I'll let Nick, having said that, I'll let Nick take the intro away. All right. So we're back with what is the fourth episode of earth friends? I think so. All right. So we reeled in my good buddy from Gambia, a real world traveler. Um, the dude's been everywhere. It's hard to keep tabs on him. <laughs> like, I'm going to get a bell and send it to him. Be like, you got to wear this wherever you go so I can track you. <laughs> my buddy, Joby. How you doing, man? Hi, Nick. I'm doing good. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> so just to like give an instance of like, how much this dude travels. So I met him in North Carolina. And then the end of that uh, semester, because we were both going to UNCG at the time, he's like, yeah, I'm going back to Gambia. And I was like, ah, oh, this sucks. Well, I'll hit you up later on. We'll, we'll try to do something. And then I hit him up to get him on the show. And he's like, yeah, I'm in Taiwan, man. <laughs> <laughs> the, the time difference is killer. But yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's go ahead, Dima, and pop these tops. Let's get the show rolling. Uh, yeah. Cheers, bud. Mm. You got it. Go. Doing the Jamie thing? Uh, mm. All right. So, real quick, give me the rundown. What's, what's a little, uh, little bit of history on Gambia? Am I saying that right? Is it okay. Gambia or Gambia? All right, so it's just Gambia. Gambia. Yeah. So basically, you also hear the other one, the Gambia. That is to kind of like distinguish it from another country which has a similar name, Zambia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's very, very tiny, small country uh, in West Africa and it has borders on its three sides with the neighboring country Senegal. So the, the, the fourth side is bordered with no country but just having the Atlantic Ocean. So basically you have this in the history of uh, Senegambia where we were taught that Gambia and Senegal used to be like uh, the same people before this idea of countries came about. So you also have like uh, almost every Gambian would have like a family connection in Senegal and vice versa, things like that. So basically Gambia is uh, an English speaking country, although we have our traditional languages, we have about nine of them. Yeah, in just this small country, you know. <laughs> so, uh, of during the, nine, the. Of the nine, how many do you speak? I can speak about three. Not fluently, like, I can speak two of them fluently but the third one i can speak you, yeah. you gotta you gotta show off for me <laughs> oh, i i can do that of course <laughs> i will try to pull it out yes please <laughs> well, go ahead what do you want him to say oh man oh that... just how about how about uh hey we welcome all of you uh to this uh show show so I can say that in Mandinka, like Mandinka is like the primary language that I learned. And you can say, uh, Ooh. <laughs> that was fast, right? Yeah. yeah. 
yeah. do it again. So that's one way. And there is other one that you can say like in Fuller, in also Wolof. You have a lot of them actually, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah, but the pretty thing about it is like uh, in Gambia, not me, but you will, it's very common. You will see people who can speak almost eight or maybe seven of these nine languages, you know? So that's, that's pretty amazing. I, 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 I applaud those kind of people. <laughs> I, I'm struggling with two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Dima's got, uh, I got, he's got broken English. <laughs> He's got sloppy Russian. <laughs> and what's the thing? <laughs> Hebrew? Mm -hmm. Some Yiddish? Some Yiddish. Oof. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's actually interesting. You know, it. Uh, I find that, uh, and, and there's been, m like, multiple studies on this. And, um, I, you know, I, I can ask you if you maybe feel the same. But, the, you know, there, there's the study where if, you know, there's a, there's a kid that grows up and he learns more than one language so the kid is a uh, bilingual those kids are shown to be more open-minded more susceptible to uh accepting change uh and just sponges you know like uh very willing to learn very willing to grow you know and and the kid that only knows one language is a little bit more of a, to, to of, a, of a dickhead <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, i i couldn't agree more because as you say language is is one way to kind of like learn about other people like you can learn about other people in your language but there is no better way to kind of like learn about other people than using their languages you know like uh personally i can also speak a lot of languages not fluently like english is one of them like i've also been to angola which is a portuguese uh speaking country so i learned to speak a little bit of portuguese and also which one like um also studying in Taiwan here. So as I said, this is my own personal view about it. When I come to Taiwan, I want to be able to like uh, learn some of their cultures through their languages, you know, not just in English or in other languages that is spoken almost everywhere. So this is something that I, I, I completely agree with you. Like once you know how to, like put yourself in other people's languages you will easily like be connected and open to some of their you understand them better mm. that's just the best way to say it yeah now you um and we we just met for the first time but uh seem like a very you know well-versed very knowledgeable smart guy you know so i really i really want to uh ask you uh what your what your story is and and how you how you you know got over Dima to the states you know Dima, and, and one, one set at a time save that for the past <laughs> that's, that's part two of the okay all right am i, I, am I going too fast what was it? yeah yeah you're what all like? gas no brakes right now so i'm going right. too fast all right, all right. Just slow down let's uh let's really back in all right so give me the the government rundown like What's the structure and a little bit of history with that? All right, so the history with that, like uh, Gambia has a very similar background with the United States uh, due to some things that uh, has influences from like the British uh, Empire. Empire before and you will see like uh, in one of the business uh, law courses that I've taken in UNCG, I, I was lucky to have that course, by the way, that course was amazing. And I was taught that most of, or some of the laws that were kind of like 
given in the United States Constitution were somehow influenced by the common law, the British common law, and things like that. So Gambia is also uh, a country that has that similar background. First, we have the three government system. You have the executive where you have the president and you also have the, the, the judiciary branch and the legislative branch, things like that. So we call them different names because I know in US, the legislative branch will be the, the Congress, right? So in the Gambia, uh, we have what we call the National Assembly. That is somehow, you know, the, the, the lawmaking body for the country. Mm -hmm. And the judiciary is similar in some aspects to the United States. And the presidency is like where you have most of the power because uh, in most cases you will have these three branches as you know, a check balance stuff on power. But we know like in some countries, uh, some are like more powerful than the other. And I think Gambia is one of them. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, what you said is absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, as we all know, historically, because uh, Africa was colonized by different European nations. Um, you were you were saying your country uh, was colonized by by Britain, and so because of that, there's that connection, right, to America and to you know, and because America had that connection to to Britain. Um, so that is interesting. How every I mean, everything is just so interconnected. You know, it's very interesting when we talk about and have exactly these, have these kind of discussions we realize just how interconnected everything is you know so exactly it's, yeah it's fucking wild yeah yeah <laughs> britain back in the day was going off on the one <laughs> jesus christ yeah uh, all right um so i mean in that sense it's almost look at like it's like looking into a mirror when you want to look at their government versus our government some different like vocabulary words, different nomenclatures, but ultimately it's about the same. Mm. Um, so then I've got a, I want to get into like um, civil rights, um, things like, you know, the LGBTQ community, um, taxation, um, things of that nature. How, how is Gambia with, with that? Okay. So I, I, before just going into that, I would just like to lay the, the background, you know, thoughts that will kind of like influence my answer to this question, because uh, you remember like one of the things that you will like, oh, a uh, group of people are govern is, has to do much with some of the things that they have been through, right? Gambia just uh, got its independence in 1965. That's barely almost 55 years, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So even though we do have the, the, the opportunity to learn some of these things, like cases that other people have gone through to make their laws based on those cases, uh, we still like very young country compared to others. Like I remember USA is 1917, almost 244 years, right? Yeah, just, just a little over 200 really. Um, so yeah. US is still pretty young when you compare them to almost any other country. See, so, so it's like that. You will have some of these things that are like uh, influencing the way we make our laws. Like in US, you will have case law systems where uh, certain you know, cases will catch the attention of the whole country and based on the constitution, things will be named that way. 
and it will be interpreted based on the constitution. So we don't have much of that because uh, we are like only uh, 55 and we are trying to learn from some of the things that has occurred in the past. So basically, uh, we, we have most of our things uh, been learned from like what we understand from the British governance system and that's, that's basically it. We have our taxation system, which is pretty, pretty much high in my own view, but yeah, somebody has to pay, pay the taxes, right? I'm and jump. you also have this, uh, these uh, political parties where each party is trying to come up with uh, a solution to some of these things. So it's it's pretty uh, a hot thing in the Gambia in a very small country. Yeah. Well, I mean, something that just fascinates me is, uh, you know, especially talking about this and hearing you say it is, you know, I think people sometimes forget that in order to build a very solid society based on laws, regulations, et cetera, it takes time. And something that you were saying is that it also through this time, it takes experience. So a lot of the time rules are made based off of situations occurring, right? And so it's just exactly. it's trial and error, right? It's trial and error, you know, somebody, something happens for the first time for such a young country, a lot of things are happening for the first time. So, you know, uh, I'm assuming a lot of the things that the U.S. is experiencing haven't necessarily been talked about or even happened in your country. Is that correct to assume? Exactly. That's, that's basically what I'm trying to say, yeah. Well, change is slow, especially when we're looking at democracy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, and, 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 you know, speaking of a lot of the things that we're going through as – in American society right now, such as, uh, you know, even when it comes to like fundamental things that you would think that <laughs> were taken care of in the beginning, but uh, unfortunately weren't, such as like civil rights and um, LGBT uh, rights and stuff like that. Um, I mean, have you, have you guys, uh, as a society started or as a as a country started working through those things, or are those not even really talked about at this point. Yes, so as you said, these uh, civil rights were things that has always been uh, in the society before even the governance system, right? We have our traditional ways of, you know, uh, kind of like uh, moral, keeping morality in society and trying to uh, make sure that uh, we, we, we know what's wrong and what's not right, things like that. Right. F influenced, influenced by the, 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 tr the tradition and how people used to be. And then you have the influence of religion also coming from uh, other parts of Africa to the Gambia that has also influenced most of our, our things that we do. So civil rights, I think uh, it's also something that is uh, given a lot of attention to uh, in the Gambia. We have regimes where we felt like uh, uh, civil rights were a little bit undermined, but uh, regime changes happen and people are trying to kind of like uh, go back to some of those topics to see how how best we can improve and to learn, just as you said to go through things based on our experience and improve for the next generation yeah and part of it is this thing that you talk about the lgbtq uh, acceptance and tolerance, things like that. I mean, we were taught since in our high schools to 
to, to be kind of like acceptance and tolerance of one another since we have all these different tribes in the country. However, this, this one based on a person's sexual preference or things like that, where it seems uh, more like a taboo. I know it existed there, but mm. I hardly uh, saw people talk about it and some would even pretend that it's, it's not an issue in the Gambia or in Africa. Well, I don't have the facts, but I can say that uh, most of these things are, are not well talked about in the Gambia, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, like we said before, you know, it's uh, you live and you learn, right? You know, and it's all based on uh, the people, right? I mean, that's the great thing about a democracy is the people, if you live in a, in, in a good situation, obviously, right? Like a democracy should be for the people and the people should decide who, what, where, when, and why, right? And uh, no, that's interesting. I mean, something that you talked about that I also want to kind of pick your brain about is uh, you talked about like this moral code, right? And these ethics. And a lot of the time when I think of that, I, I, I know I got myself, I, I was exposed to many different religions when I was young, you know, uh, Judaism, uh -huh. Islam, uh, Christianity, obviously, and stuff like that. And I found that a lot of traditional religion gave me a pretty good moral compass. Um, now, what, uh, two questions for you, and you can decide what to tackle first. But do you, first of all, what is the predominant religion? And second of all, uh, what do you, do you think that based on the religions that are out there, do you, do you agree with me that religion gives a kind of a, a good moral compass. kind of foundation and a compass for a person in, um, in that situation? Well, First of all, on your first question, Gambia is predominantly a Muslim country. You have uh, Muslims uh, taking about uh, 85 to 90 percent of the population. So you also have uh, second one is the, the, the Christian population. You also have a lot of them. And then you have uh, a very, very tiny population of uh, people in the traditional religion, things like that. And the thing is like, these things have a lot of influences because uh, even talking about some of these things and the laws, it's always a push and pull, all these things will have to you know, have a common ground. And it's sometimes difficult to have uh, like a common ground on all these things. It takes about uh, compromise and listening to each other, which people sometimes find it difficult to do, you know. So as you said, these are the things, the religions that we have. We have this uh, traditional uh, ethic codes that were there even before these religions, and I, I still see people holding on to that. Yes. Mm. Now, you were pointing at our friend here. I mean, what were you pointing at? Well, I, I was going to agree that, like, when when people come from, especially like especially different religious backgrounds, it, it makes it hard to like find a middle ground. But I would say that if you if you don't look at it. In the, Short term, it's it's way harder to say that you're going to go to to arms against someone else or, or be in conflict with someone else in the long run. Right. That ultimately, it's painful for everyone. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. So, like, to make the easier decision is bite the bullet early on and and, and be nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. I'm not saying it's easy, but it it's easy in the long run. Yeah, it's going to save your ass in the long run. Right. You know? There's a lot a lot fewer hurt feelings. For sure. And uh, that's what I'm here about. Amen to that. 
Was that both questions? Are we good? Mm-hmm. Okay, just making sure. What you got? I got, I got to go get a cord for this because it's going to die soon. But uh, what you got next? All right. So let me go through my checklist here because we got to make sure we cover all of that. Uh, we're about we're about three quarters of the way down the list. So I've got like two more questions. Um, how's the healthcare system? Because I know in America, we've compared that to other countries and it just doesn't make any damn sense. Like our, our healthcare system is so out of whack. It's completely taken over by capitalism. And I'm just wondering, what's it like in the Gambia? Good. So the reason why I gave this uh, different level of uh, structures is because I have to make reference to it over and over again, right? Uh, if you talk about the healthcare system in the United States, probably you might think that it sucks compared to other countries like uh, maybe Taiwan here yeah, where you have a national health insurance plan for everyone. However, uh, for the Gambia, it's more like we are in the building stage. You understand? So you have to have a, a complete comprehensive healthcare system first, then you can be able to say uh, it's good or bad compared to this country or that country, right? However, it's like uh, for us, it's more like how do we build this to that level for us whereby we can say, okay, we now have a very comprehensive healthcare system that uh, can be competitive uh, compared to other countries. So it's more like we are building it. And that's, that's obviously where I started when I first graduated from high school. Cause I remember when I graduated, I, I got a government scholarship to study uh, medicine at the University of the Gambia. And there you have to be working with healthcare professionals while still attending uh, classes. So I decided to take that uh, program. And that is just because I wanted to like be with my mom because obviously my mom is living in the Gambia even though my dad and my little sister are living in the U.S. New York. So I ended up uh, changing course because first of all number one I I'm not that medical type of person I feel like I can do better for the world for the people uh, in finance and business areas than being in the medical areas, you know, the medicine program. So I then decided to kind of like take what I believe in. And based on my experience uh, at the medical school, I think uh, we still need a lot to, to be done in the Gambia when it comes to healthcare, you know, like, Basically, you will have people uh, going to few hospitals uh, believing that uh, they wouldn't be referred to other hospitals like one-stop hospital that can provide you pretty much all your healthcare needs. And it's, it's somehow affordable, but its presence in the other regions in the country is something that the government really need to work on because it's it's always inconvenient to travel like from one part to the other just to be treated or just to have a health care service yeah uh, like especially in in your country's case because it's it's such a um i'm not really sure if it's which one's latitude which one's longitude you should know this. I, I should know this, but I wasn't a fucking navigation <laughs> guy. I was a fucking Long, longitude flat. You could have just answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you have a very long country. So like if the hospital is like on the opposite end of the country and you need to go, like there's the problem. Yeah. It's a it's a logistics 
in geography uh, issue. And, and it sounds like, uh, you know, where you guys being such a young country and trying to like develop these core infrastructures, uh, it, it's in development. You're still, you're still working on it. But exactly. That's, that's crazy. Cause I, I honestly, I, I'm still trying to get over the fact that that country is that young. I, I didn't know. I, I didn't know that at all. And I'm really glad that I learned it. Yeah. I mean, you find that a lot of, uh, there you go, Nick, number two, um, a lot of, uh, and th maybe I'm like completely butchering this. So correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of, uh, and maybe not a lot, but a Enter good amount. Dima, the butcher. <laughs> uh, a, a good amount of Af African countries, right, have just only recently, um, historical wise, became, you know, independent, right? Uh, because of the colonization thing, right? Is, I mean, is that correct? Or Yes, that's correct. Right? It's, there's many different right, uh, African countries that are kind of in the same boat. The. Oh, the, sorry. Yeah. The, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, no, it is, it is interesting. I mean, again, I mean, a lot of the time, uh, really, whenever, or, like, things are being talked about in the world it's really only the u.s a european country or uh russia you know and so it's like you know a lot of the time we we don't look at these smaller countries and 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 really necessarily know about the history right and and it's rich history right it's very rich history just because the gambia is what did you say around 50 55 years right old exactly around that uh, I mean, just because it's 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 a it's fifty five years old doesn't mean that its history doesn't go back all the way down dude, time. Dude, dude, so, dude! My grandma is older than his country. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I I hope she sticks around for you know another fifty five years plus. Like that. But yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Right. So based based on this, you have like a government initiative that really, really helps. I have to admit that because uh, if you look at Gambia, you have different regions and you have the, the West Coast region where you have the capital city and all that stuff. Healthcare is not an issue around those regions, but if you go in the deeper end where you have the upper river coast, Sorry, the upper river region and the central region. Sometimes yeah, you have uh, a, a major river that runs almost the entire length of the country, right? Exactly, exactly. So it's so like, like you have one river, and it's like so it almost, you know, in a sense, it divides your country into north and south. It's it's exactly a river. It's crazy. Yeah. So you will have these bridges almost at every point in the Gambia, like in the midsection and in the end and you also have it around banjo where the capital city is so that's that's how basically they, they they initiated this project to have like major health centers at uh the upper end and in the central end and also the capital city as i said uh healthcare is not big of an issue because you have uh a lot of other clinics too some are foreign some are you know like people there have the economic power to afford uh some of their basic health care so i believe like if the government doesn't uh have all the health centers needed people can sometimes uh go to those clinics and get their things done yeah okay mm. That's a, I mean, I know we're making light of the topic to a degree, you know, we're not necessarily picking it apart. And that's mostly because like none of us are experts at healthcare or anything necessarily to do with government. Important thing to mention. <laughs> but I, I mean, honestly, I feel like the, the country's taking a pretty good approach at it. I mean, I, I can't say that it's like, 
you know, leaving me with a sad feeling. I'm into it. I'm fucking into it, bud. Yeah. So the other thing is like when it comes to uh, the United States, probably healthcare is going to be one of the top priorities, right? Yeah. God. Okay. So, so that is because, uh, in my view, the United States has done pretty good job in other areas like in their financial sector, the economy and the infrastructure, things like that, right? So you have like pretty much uh, a narrow, you know, or let me say a precise uh, points that you know you can improve on. However, in the case of the Gambia, almost if you look at all these points, you are still at the development stage. There is a lot, lot, lot of work that needs to be done on all these points from the markets to the economy to other parts. So it's like, I know healthcare should be like really, really important, but you will hardly see a Gambian politician, you know, trying to win the Gambian people's vote, advocating for uh, healthcare. And that is because, yes, and that is because uh, there are other things that people feel like are more, you know, demanding, you know, Healthcare is also important. I have to that, stress that. Yeah, that makes sense though. I mean, if it's like still in in that early stage where like there hasn't been a president for like needing to correct an issue necessarily as much as it is just to develop the infrastructure completely, then like yeah, why would your politician want to talk about that when we all know where it's at? You know. Now, um, something that interests me is, uh, so I have one of my best friends, he's uh, from Ethiopia, and uh, he, he, he has told me that... Um, that's the opposite side, right? That's, that's, that's the east, east, eastern, yeah, yeah, east side. Africa. Exactly, yeah. So something that he said that Ethiopia is doing is they're teaming up with China, because China's kind of throwing money at them. And in return, they kind of give China a lot of land so they can, they can develop crops, et cetera, et cetera. Do you, are, are there any bigger nations that are going into the, the Gambia and kind of trying to- De Develop like a joint venture? Right. Yeah, so if you look at some of these things, it comes with some strategic locations and things like that. And Gambia, strategically, you can say it's, it's uh, almost covered on all its three sides by Senegal, right? Mm. So you do have some of these uh, foreign you know, cooperations and collaborations, but they are predominantly in Senegal more than in the Gambia. Yes, you, you have it. And also, like most of these things that you said, like uh, China collaborating with Ethiopia on some sectors, you also have that. I mean, we are human beings, you know, like you have this human nature in our governments from all over the world, like uh, trying to help in other people's development processes. Yes, the United States, UK, and uh, other countries in Asia, they are also like acting as a as a partner sometimes, you know, in, in, in these developmental processes. But I have to stress like the main thing has to come from we the Africans and the Gambians to make sure that uh, we take these issues head on, you know. Yes. Yeah. That is very, that I, is. Yeah, no, I, I, from a business standpoint and also from having like any kind of military background, I would say it's best if you can handle it on your own because then you're not in someone's pocket. Right. Exactly. And I know that's kind of a street term being in the pocket, but that's, I mean, that's as gangster as it gets. You're in someone's fucking pocket. 
well, you, you owe them a favor or two. And you don't, you, I, especially, you know, at the ripe young age of 55, you don't want to own any, I owe anybody shit. Well, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that's exactly where I was going with it is, you know, you know, being such a, such a, a young country and, um, if you, if you rely on other countries a little bit too much, it starts kind of taking away from the development that you, and, as, a, as, a, as a person. And, and it takes away society. from the identity of that nation. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because then you exactly. become, you know, then yeah. let's say you're like heavily dependent on China, you become little China. Yeah, you know? exactly. And you don't want to be so. So that's, that is one thing that people are advocating for, like, uh, most most educated uh, people in Africa would would really advocate for things like this. Like uh, we can learn about how other people did it and work with them. But at the end of the day, when it's uh, time to take actions and lead the whole thing, we want to be able to just lead the whole thing by ourselves yeah amen yeah and uh keep that shit in house yeah kind of going on the same topic here i mean it's uh kind of taking it a little bit darker on a, on a little bit darker of a road i mean it's like uh don't get scary yeah i'm not gonna i'm not i'm trying i'm gonna <laughs> halloween's already passed i'm not trying to get too scary um so it's like uh a lot of the time we see these bigger countries uh, take advantage of uh, African African nations because, Af you know, Africa is just, I mean, one of the richest continents in terms of just mineral goods, right? Well, like, natural resources. Natural resources is what I meant, you know? And so it's like, it's very important. He's just thinking about fucking diamonds, man, forgive me. <laughs> And so it's, you know, it's, uh, it is very, that's, that's why it's so important, you know, for, I but feel like we've all mentioned that for, to stay authentic, to getting, stay Getting into that topic scares me though. I, just talking about like natural resources, because once you like uproot those natural resources and things of that nature, like once you start digging into the earth, you're throwing off like the ecosystem completely. You, you're really getting to like dangerous territory. You're like, 2020 we're talking about sustainability <laughs> but i was going to get into um economic concerns because your country is you know on three sides covered by an entire another country like a single entity um do you guys have any economic concerns from just from that like i don't know um i know like if if uh let's say like the u.s was like surrounded by like, mexico we'd be like well, we have no no fucking jobs here. So like, okay, okay. So in in our case, it's it's totally the opposite, because uh, as I said, uh, this is hugely understood by Gambians and Senegalese that uh, we might have our differences as uh, a French country or an English speaking country but at the end of the day we are uh, the same people like for instance uh, myself i would go to like senegal to to visit some of my my, my families there because I, I do have connections there and it's basically on that path you know you you will have a lot of senegalese you know uh, in the Gambian economy, and you will have a lot of Gambians too working in the uh, Senegalese borders. And because Gambia has almost entirely cut Senegal into two parts, you also have Senegal kind of like uh, trying to uh, involve in like the logistics, the road transportation system in the Gambia so that, you know, uh, the movement of goods and services from one so part of the They want to go from north to south or vice versa. Yes. You guys yeah. profit so, off of the... Yeah, so off. it's like a win-win situation for the two people, yeah. I don't no think way. we have that issue of you you well know, like being worried about being surrounded by them, you know. All right. Yeah. 
Now I've yeah. got to I've got to ask because you know the continent of Africa is how many countries are in Africa like a lot like 40 50 Well this number keeps changing because as you know there are still uh, issues going on in other parts of the world and sometimes it results in the formation of a whole new country you know so africa we have about 55 countries now <laughs> with with southern sudan that is that is oh, new okay. so I, w- I would ask like yeah. um, like you guys you guys in the gambia are, are kind of nestled away uh because senegal acts as a buffer between you and the, the rest of africa but like are there any like like uh issue countries that you're, you're ever concerned about can you repeat that question are there any what are there like are there any countries um within africa that like the gambia would be concerned of like are there any like hostilities mm. Basically, no, because uh, for for this kind of things, all what I can remember is that uh, countries that are in the West Africa have contributed a lot in also helping Gambia stand on its feet, like uh, the Nigeria. Uh, you also have Ghana like some of these English speaking countries, right? So we have uh, organizations that kind of like bring French speaking countries together. And sometimes they do have their developmental projects and programs. And so are the English speaking countries doing too. And we also have a platform whereby uh, these pre-colonization stuff doesn't matter. We all come together to kind of like uh, make policies that we think is gonna work for for Africa and for West Africa. Like you have a whole organization that is responsible for things like this. When it comes to hostility, first of all, we have never been to a war. Mm -hmm. That is something, yeah and yeah historically i wouldn't remember any country that has a direct you know confrontation with the gambia yeah my dude said no beef no beef no beef (laughs) um and speaking of uh speaking of no beef and speaking of uh just people i kind of want to ask you because i come from um I don't know. I come from a very small country in Eastern Europe called uh, Moldova. I don't know if you if you've heard of it, but um, no one's heard of Moldova. <laughs> but uh, so I find a lot of the time when I go home, it's I, I'm re- I'm constantly reminded of how connected people are to one another. Because if you come from a situation where there's little money people have to rely on the community a little bit more. People have to rely on their neighbors a little bit more. If you don't have money to pay for food for maybe this week, you ask your neighbor to help and they know that maybe next week, if they need anything, maybe you can help. Um, is it is it very, is it kind of similar um, in the Gambia where you, you have a very close knit community, uh, people rely on each other a lot more um, or maybe not? Yes, that's exactly the case in the Gambia. First of all, uh, Gambia depends hugely on agriculture, right? We have about uh, 75% of our labor employment is in the agricultural sector. So you do have uh, a lot of families like uh, specializing in the cultivation of a certain type of plant or crop things like that and at the end of the day you cannot just uh, feed on only one type of plant you need to sell you need to also share with neighbors 
and in return you will also get some other stuff like money that you can use to send your kids to school and uh, food that you probably don't have in your region you know so you can also use that as as a form of you know you know something that you can depend on so we we do have this interaction between neighbors and communities yeah i love hearing that that part about having like family operated like agriculture um especially when it is like a family tradition there's a line there like a, a lineage of people cultivating the same land working for the same like crops because they're like certain tricks of the trade that get passed down generationally and it grows and it expands and it we'd say this a lot but it creates a snowball effect um leading to the most effective uh produce like or production of produce and i i love that just another yeah is, yeah i love i it. mean look at me it's it's pretty much in all gambian families you you would have your professional job but it doesn't stop you from having like a part-time agricultural job you know you can still work in your office and maybe on weekends and things like that join the the, the, the plants you know and see what you can do like what you can grow it's it's something that is really common in the gambia and this is one of the things that encourages me to to kind of like uh study and develop my career in business and finance because gambia used to be a very uh, good exporter of peanuts right so in the 80s, they were having a lot of government support where the government would like uh, seal deals for farmers uh, in the outside world where farmers can you know, export their harvest and things like that and change it into something like cash or things like that. However, we've seen uh, a sharp drop in this kind of things due to like this global competition that you're seeing right now. So uh, I believe like Gambia also at some point has to need uh, people in the finance sector, people in the business sector who will help these politicians to kind of like make informed decisions, you know, that will kind of like have a greater impact on these farmers, on the tourism and things like that, instead of just uh, attending programs and signing deals that they might not have fully understanding of. Yeah, so that is one thing that keeps pushing me. I hope I can one day like help them like understand the impact of some of these yeah. the economic impact of some of these things yeah I in the global arena 100 yeah. percent behind you politicians they need to do their fucking homework no <laughs> they gotta you know yeah something uh we've been you know speaking so much on a geo kind of a geo political political and also just a, a geographical level you know where a world level right i kind of want to bring it down to you all right and you're gonna switch gears i'm gonna switch gears right. and in the beginning you said i was going fast so all i'm right, gonna go all back right. all right you you can switch gears after this question okay good uh it's not necessarily a question per se but i i would like for you to compare and contrast the gambia to the united states and just give us like some quick pros and cons, things that you do like, things that you don't like. Maybe things that you find weird, like what the fuck are these guys doing? Yeah, we ran this by, uh, we talked to our buddy Sean, shout out to Sean in London. Yeah, shout and out uh, he gave us a few things that he thinks Americans do that are just fucking weird. And like, yeah, so anything you want to like point out, please. Yeah, so as I said, um, on on my visits in the united states and during the time i i stayed to study there uh i've always noticed like a lot of gambians are also enrolled in other schools in other states so 
this has to do with my age, you know, because uh, maybe young people will have a different mindset as compared to the old generation. But a lot of uh, people at, at the youth age is like, will see a United States as a very, very, very good destination for education. You have really, really strong and big institutions when it comes to education. And these are some of the things that kind of like give rise to a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, companies, farms that in turn contribute a lot to the development and the progress of the United States. So having these great institutions is one thing that I, not only me, but my friends in high school would admire the United States. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing is about the diversity that you will see in the United States is, it's quite amazing. Uh, I personally traveled maybe to almost four of almost five continents. I've been here in Asia for like three to four years now. And I've been to Europe, I've seen things there. I've been to other parts of Africa. However, uh, the diversity that you will see in the United States, it's, it's, it's unmatched, you know, like it's hard to see this in other countries. Here, like, yeah, I have to say this, like uh, the, the ideals that are like fundamental to the, the United States as a country is completely different when you go to uh, other countries, they will base on, they will base their things on citizenship and their laws on, mostly on ethnicity and where you are from, where you are born, things like that. Do you belong to us? And however, you do see this in the United States, like it doesn't matter where you come from. You know, you can just uh, have the same ideals as we do and you can be part of us, you can be one of us. This is, this is great and it shows a great strength of diversity. However, I also have to point out the other side, you know, like sometimes diversity can be good if you look at it in um, some aspects, but if you are not able to uh, see it in the right direction, it can also lead to a lot of division, you know, like you have people uh, of different kinds, you know, each having different ideologies, you know. So it's, it's even hard to, to live together, but once you can listen to one another, you can turn your diversity into strength. I think it's, it's one of the greatest things about America. Yeah, I mean, that was fucking romantic. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's... I, I couldn't have said that better. That's something, that's something that, you know... I, I, I definitely feel that Americans, like, not Americans, huh? not, not Americans like this guy, but <laughs> the general populace Americans kind of play down the diversity thing the way that most people look at it is black white hispanic or other and it's like that that other like what the hell what the hell is that <laughs> but dude if you don't pop that up Dima's over here getting drunk not yet <laughs> all right now Dima you may switch your gear Thank you, Joby. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been such a such a like, informative informative episode, um, and we really appreciate you for getting on here. But so, uh, maybe to kind of wrap this up, a uh, question that I did have for you, and this is more of a again, it, it gets a little bit more personal, and it gets uh, a little bit more about you. 
um, because we have been so geopolitical, as we said before. I mean, you know, and, and I, I feel like people would like to hear just to give and understand a little bit more context about you, right? Um, I kind of want to ask about your your experience, right? Your uh, and I'm, you know, this can be very short. It doesn't have to be autobiographical. You don't have to list everything that you've uh, <laughs> accomplished or you've seen throughout your life. But um, how how did you how did you grow up in your country, and how did you get over to the states, and what are you working on now, and maybe talk a little bit about that, what, you, what you're what you comfortable with talking about. And I'd love to, I think, I not only me, but I, I think the viewers and listeners would love to hear about that a little what, bit. What about me? And Nick. Yes, <laughs> sure, Nick would. I'm in the room. But sure. he already knows. <laughs> yeah, so I was born and raised in the Gambia. And that's where I attended like uh, my basic education and after graduating from the high school, I still didn't know like what to do in life, honestly. So I ended up uh, joining the medical school and that's where I kind of like uh, sat down and tried to see like deep down in me, what do I want to do in life and things like that. And from there, I took on a lot of challenges, personal goals to just go out of my comfort zone and just see the world, you know. That's, that's what led to me having to travel to a lot of countries, you know, for business, because I worked in Angola previously. Uh, for a family friend who was operating an intercontinental business there. And that can also uh, influence a lot of decisions that I take, like uh, how do I uh, go from this level to a level where I can be uh, a very good resource for my country, for all the other people in the Gambia, but basically for being able to like uh, help politicians through the Ministry of Finance in the Gambia uh, to make informed decisions and to also help the Gambia to be uh, competitive when it comes to uh, deals on the international table. So that's pretty much uh, the thing that pushes me to see different countries, their law system, the way they do business and things like that. And I also have family members in the US, so going there wouldn't be uh, an issue. So I also plan to uh, transfer or kind of like move the other part of my educational career to the US pretty much after some work experience. So that's basically it, you know, about me. And for future, I think, yeah, just like anybody else, we should all strive, you know, to, to, to change something in the world, you know, uh, to kind of like make this world a better place for everyone. Globalization is coming, is almost here, one can say, but, uh, sometimes we need to do more in order to kind of like help one another and to also focus our attention on some of these things that we want to achieve in life yeah yeah and that's such a beautiful way to joey's a fucking national hero you better respect him yeah i mean that was gonna say Fuck. you know that's such a beautiful way to kind of wrap all of this up and this podcast stuff with you saying that I mean, it, there's just such a, I mean, if, 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 I don't know, I see it, but like the fact that you want to go back and help your country really, I mean, just says it all. Like, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people here in the States, you know, they just want to fucking it's, help themselves. It's all me, know? me, so, me, me, me. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's all, that's all, that's all. It, I mean, it, it just says it all from the thing that you just, you know, you kind of summed up in your beautiful kind of 
explanation of what you want to attain and get to. You know, we um, were talking about earlier how how he knows so many fucking languages and like how like, everyone has a language they like work around and come together. I was uh, just thinking about it in my head. The two of you probably have a uh, a language you could talk to a degree at least. I don't know if you're going to meet in the middle here or not, but this is a, a really cool test platform to see if you can get along, but you're both a couple of soccer heads or football. Yeah. No, I yeah. Love yeah. <laughs> no, football. I love soccer. What's I your, what's your soccer. team? Uh, you mean the team that I play for or the one that I watch? I don't even know you played for a team, but the one that you, you know, that, that you love, what's your favorite team? All right, so growing up, I I always like Arsenal in in UK Premier League, right? Yeah, but recently they saw, you know, so I'm not very much <laughs> their fan anymore. But yeah, soccer is something that I loved. And Nick would remember, even in my time at the UNCG, you know, like this... Uh, some of the things that would bring people together, you know. I, I made a lot of friends there by just having soccer as one of my hobbies, you know, and it's it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I no. didn't know that you, you you can also do soccer. Can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean I I, I played okay. on a couple of a couple of uh state teams and they they kicked him off though because he's a fucking troublemaker. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, I'm about to leave it too, you know, because, yeah, I played for my university team here, but as as I go up with my career stuff, I'm getting more busy, you know, so I, I hardly have time to play now. I, like, now, um, I I imagine that, like, in Taiwan, like, all the soccer players are, like, really small people. And so, like, I know, like, me personally, I can't play soccer for two reasons. One, really small. One, I'm slower than shit. And two, you'd be a good defender. I'm a bulldozer. You'd be a good defender. <laughs> All I'm like good. a, I'm like a fucking tractor. Yeah, you just have to worry. You, you, you would have to be very, very careful, careful. about fouling someone. Oh yeah, I get a red card in a minute. Yeah, so you, you, would, them, you would, they'd be like, you'd be a good defender. They'd be like, get that fat piece of shit off the field. He's killing <laughs> everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I also used to think like that, but when you come, it's gonna be a different thing. You know, you're gonna see a lot of, lot of strong Taiwanese players who will just. Yeah, work. give you a very tough match, right? Yeah. Also, like, I mean, I've got two options. One, they take the ball from me and they run, and I can't watch their feet because they're moving a million miles an hour. Or I run through the guy and get a card. <laughs> you know, I, I, like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I really need to work on my cardio foot game, you know? Yeah. But, but one thing, though, uh, basketball is more famous, more popular in Taiwan than soccer. Right? I mean – yeah, you have a lot of them here. I'm go. I mean, I'm I'm a growing boy. I'm steadily approaching. You got potential. Steadily approaching seven feet tall. You know, I'm thinking by like the end of next year, I'll probably be like six foot eight, six foot nine. He's got to keep. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. More vegetables, man. Um. Well, listen. This has been an amazing episode. Thank you so much for really coming on and uh, allowing our viewers and listeners to really uh, get insight into your country and, and a little bit into your life. Um, you are doing amazing things. You're a super smart guy. We really appreciate you giving us the time um, to kind of pick your brain and ask you a couple of questions. Um, and uh, yeah, no, thank you, really. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And uh, I mean, where can the beautiful folks that are listening and viewing, if they would like to, maybe if they have any questions about uh, economics or maybe geoeconomic, is that term geoeconomics? I, I don't think anyone calls it geoeconomics. What would it be? 
World economics. World economics. Yeah. <laughs> World economics, or you know, I'm not. I'm not a business major. I'm an art major, so I have no idea. But uh, <laughs> can you tell me about geo eco? <laughs> well, where, where can the where can the folks find you? I mean, do you have any you know social medias that you would like to plug, or I mean, anything that you're comfortable with sharing where people can maybe find you, ask questions, and if so, yeah, you, so. you just. Point your finger over your shoulder like this, and we'll put a little pop up right there. Okay. All right. So, um, by just uh, connecting me on Facebook, I, I can, because I've seen a lot of organizations working on things like this. So, there can be that uh, connection that I can enhance or enable for anyone if you are interested to know with this kind of things because this is really important like I've seen a lot of them during my studies here online uh, you will see a lot of them pulling data on Africa and sometimes yes these data might not be 100% accurate but because uh, most of these uh, are given by Africans but most of them like I haven't been to Africa to kind of like get these data firsthand. So you have like some of these organizations in Africa who I think it's really, really important to get them connected once you want to know about this geopolitics and all that economic stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so just write your name in there. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and do that. And, uh, well, the folks can write your name, not you literally, but the folks can write your name in there. They can find you on Facebook. They can reach out to you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, this has been another wonderful, wonderful experience and another episode of the 4099 podcast. With your Dima host. just forgot the fucking name. <laughs> the 4099 podcast with your host, Dima and, and Nick. And, uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.